<laughs> okay, so welcome back everyone. And today we are going to be diving into step four of the adaptation workbook. This is also session four. And so this is the one we know a lot of people have been waiting for. This is when we really get to start thinking um, in depth about some of the adaptation strategies, approaches, and tactics that we want to apply and implement in our projects. So this is usually an exciting one where we get into real solutions-oriented mode. You know all of us, hopefully by now. So um, <laughs> Leslie and I will be doing most of the talking during this session, but we also have Danielle, Courtney, and Patricia joining us, and maybe a few other instructors that I didn't necessarily see on the list right away. Um, so welcome from all of us. For the agenda today, we'll go through a quick recap of step three. Um, this will be either a recap for you if you've really, really made headway on this step, or perhaps a, a little reminder for folks who are still working on it. Um, and we'll spend the bulk of the day today talking generally about adaptation options and some of the tools that we have for selecting actions. And then introducing step four and what the specific components of step four of the adaptation workbook are. So step three, as you recall from last week, is really focused on thinking about how climate change might affect your management goals and objectives and evaluating those objectives, given all the, the climate change vulnerabilities that you identified from literature and other sources. So in step three, we ask you to sit down and think about how climate change might challenge your objectives, how maybe it can provide some opportunities for achieving your objectives, and to really weigh those things together to think about how feasible your objectives are going to be moving forward under kind of average business as usual management scenario. And at least from the people I've talked to, the project groups I've talked to, um, a lot of folks have made some headway with this or are, you know, are kind of just on the precipice of diving into step three. So if you haven't completed this yet, no worries. Um, this week and next week will be great times to, to catch up on any steps of the workbook that you haven't completed yet. And we are around um, for questions if you need us. So in step four, uh, we really focus on identifying adaptation approaches that might work for our projects and then fleshing out and developing adaptation tactics. Um, and to do that, we use these tools, menus of adaptation strategies and approaches, and we'll get a little more into the menus and what those are. The key question we're asking ourselves for step four is, is kind of a two-parter. So we're thinking about what are those actions that are going to enhance the ability of the project area to adapt to climate change while meeting your management goals. So we're thinking about both of those things simultaneously. We want to we want to move forward on meeting the goals for your project, but we want to do it in a in a way that helps the area adapt to climate change. So in this step, uh, it's really about getting to work on thinking about some of those tactics. Um, so, you know, given everything that we entered in in steps two and three, um, all those climate vulnerabilities that we've thought about, how are we going to design actions that actually address those vulnerabilities? And as I mentioned, we have tools to help you with that. Um, the main tool that we use in this step and that we like to share with people are the menus of adaptation strategies and approaches. And a, a menu is really exactly what it sounds like. It is a collection of possible adaptation actions that you can pick and choose from based on your situation and what makes sense for your project area. The menus are often specific to a discipline. So for example, we've been talking a lot about the recreation focused adaptation menu, which is one that we'll be leaning on heavily for this course. 
Um, so in addition to the, the recreation focused one, we may have menus that are focused on specific ecosystems like forested ecosystems or wetland ecosystems. So it's just a way of grouping those adaptation responses together in a way that makes sense for a particular discipline or focus area. And then finally, these menus are organized into broad categories, which we call strategies. So that's kind of the broadest level of categorization for the adaptation menus. So just a little bit more about the organization of the adaptation menus. Um, one of the, the main benefits we feel to the adaptation menu is really uh, connecting broad adaptation ideas with specific adaptation actions. And that's something that before, before publishing uh, our first menu at NIACS, we weren't seeing a lot of. We were seeing a lot of literature out there that had you know, fairly general adaptation concepts and ideas and literature with really specific examples. But there was often a little bit of a disconnect between kind of how those specific actions tied into those broad adaptation ideas. And so we, we feel and we hope that one of the main functions of a menu is connecting those, um, those various tiers of adaptation ideas. So um, this is going to cover, this is going to go through some information that's covered in a video that is assigned uh, in your homework for this week. So if you're not familiar with these terms, don't worry. Um, these are contained in that homework. But at the very broadest level, um, many of our adaptation menus are kind of organized along this, these three main adaptation concepts of resistance, resilience, and transition. And then, as I mentioned, um, the broadest level of organization in the menu of itself are these strategies. So these are, are quite broad ideas, um, broad adaptation responses. And then underneath that, we have approaches which get a little bit more specific. They may call out a specific resource area or geography or season um, or, or something a little bit more specific than a strategy. And then the tactic is really what um, you will individually be developing for your project. So the tactic is where you can get really specific as to what makes sense for your project, your place, your time frame, et cetera. I'm just going to fly through an example here to, to show you how moving from the broad to the specific works in the case of the menus. So, you know, at the very top level, we might be thinking about um, you know, promoting resilience in our project area, in our system. So, you know, how do we allow our system to bounce back after a climate disturbance? Within that, um, using the recreation menu, you might key in on a strategy like manage impacts from shifting visitation and use trends. And within that, you might identify the approach, uh, reduce visitor impacts to vulnerable areas as being one that's particularly applicable. And so what that looks like in your project is going to vary from place to place, but an example tactic within that might be okay, you know, for our lakes and rivers, we want to implement closures when temperatures get really high in order to protect aquatic organisms or human health. So again, it, it provides an example of um, how this tactic of closures in lakes or rivers ties back into your overall adaptation response. So we think that a few benefits to using the adaptation menu include this idea of connecting broad ideas to specific actions, as I mentioned. And by doing that, it also helps make your adaptation actions intentional. So it can help you describe how something that you want to do on the landscape can tie back into your overall adaptation intent and direction. Um, and, and one reason that that's really advantageous is it then helps you communicate this to potential, um, to potential audiences, to your partners, um, you know, maybe your supervisor in some cases. So you can really show them, okay, here's the direction we're going with our adaptation and these are the actions we're taking to get there. And then finally, we hope that uh, having a menu to look through 
Um, and that having that comprehensive collection of adaptation ideas is a way to help boost creativity. So maybe it'll give you a few ideas that you hadn't thought about before or encourage you to think about a, a slightly different direction for your project area and for adapting to climate change in your project area. We have many different menus at this point. As I mentioned, these are organized roughly around different resource areas. And the ones that you see on the left are all included as an option in the online workbook. So as you move into step four, you'll have the option to pick from any of these menus on the left, pick strategies and approaches from them. We do have other published menus that are available. They're just not integrated into the online workbook. And so that URL on the right, forestadaptation.org slash strategies, is a great place to get access to those menus that might not be integrated right in the workbook. Um, and then we've got a few that are in draft form that may be a little trickier to find. And so if you are interested in one of those menus, um, you can find out a little bit more about it at that same URL, but if you have any trouble tracking that down or wanna take, a, to, take an early look at a draft, you can contact us in the course and we can get you um, a draft of those menus to look at. So that was a little bit of a tour through menus and the menu structure. Uh, if you want more information specifically on the recreation menu um, and on some of the other menus that we have available, we are having an optional session this Wednesday. So this is, we don't have any discussion sessions this week. Um, instead, we have this optional session. So you're welcome to join us on Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern or view the recording afterwards. Um, and I know there was a little bit of confusion about the timing of this. I think we had a different time listed in the slides from last week. So just a note, you should have an invite on your calendar and the special session will be Wednesday, April 28th in the afternoon, Eastern time. So we'll talk a little bit more in this session about the recreation menu, its structure and development, and dive into the specific strategies and approaches in a little bit more depth. I'm gonna pause right there for a second, just make sure there's no questions that have come in via chat or any anybody wanna unmute and ask any questions, this would be a good time to do that as well. Okay, great. Oh, just, um, sorry, one question. Sure. Um, if there is not something in the menu that applies to what we're thinking, do we just make up our own? So that that's an interesting question. Um, the men, or sorry, the workbook will ask you to identify a specific approach but then it will give you full freedom to develop your own tactic. So we'll go into this a little bit more in a few slides about the specific structure of the workbook. You will always have free reign to lay out your own tactic, your own action that you wanna implement there. But then um, the workbook will ask you to tie that back into an approach and a strategy. Um, if there's no applicable approach, I do think the menu, let, or I, I'm sorry, I do think the workbook, <laughs> fixing up my terminology today, I do think the workbook lets you tie that directly to just a strategy. Um, Danielle or Leslie, can you confirm or deny that? You should use the menus that are offered to you within the adaptation workbook. Right now we don't have like a custom feature. Um, but you could always do the adaptation workbook. You just talk to us if there's um, a work, uh, a menu that's unavailable to you online that you'd like to integrate into your, your project. Yeah, or if you have a great idea for a tactic, but you don't quite see where it fits in into one of the existing menus, um, you know, we can maybe help a little bit with that, or you can, can fudge it a little bit and just kind of, um, you know, tie it into the hierarchy, which is what the, the workbook will ask of you, but even if it's not like the, the most perfect fit. Um, 
so yeah, we can we can definitely work with you one on one if that situation arises. And hopefully Leslie's slides about this step in a little bit will clarify that a little bit more. Okay, um, I mentioned these three terms earlier, and so some people might be very familiar with these, some people less so. Uh, we do have a video for everyone to watch this week that um, talks a little bit more about these three main adaptation concepts and, um, and what they mean and talks more generally about developing adaptation actions. So we'll go over um, resistance, resilience, and transition for you and, and how those differ. And the URL to that video is included in your getting started guide. And as usual, you'll be getting an email following this lecture that has that URL as well. Um, so one of the main, main ideas behind using the menus and along with the workbook process in general is really this idea of creating a coherent story and connecting all of these individual dots. So, you know, you might have come into this course with a really good idea of what you wanted to do in your project area and, and some idea of, you know, how those actions were climate adaptive or what, you know, climate adaptation might look like in your area. A big advantage to this process is that it really helps you step through all of those pieces and create a coherent chain of logic from, you know, what are you trying to do on the landscape? What are your goals and objectives? How does climate change challenge that or interact with that? And then what direction do you want to go with your adaptation? And then specifically, how are you going to get there with the tactics that you implement on the ground? So a lot of it's really about tying these pieces together, not necessarily about creating something brand new or something out of the blue that you haven't already been thinking about. And just to illustrate that point a little bit more, this is a, this is a very unscientific depiction of <laughs> many of the, the adaptation projects that we've worked with over the years. And so, you know, in many cases, groups working on climate adaptation end up selecting adaptation actions that really look very similar to what they're already doing or planning for management in their system. So it just might be that climate change makes these more um, important or makes them more pressing or forces you to prioritize them a little bit more. Uh, we do encounter a lot of groups that also change their management practices in small ways to improve their effectiveness. So maybe that means changing the timing of when you're doing a specific action or changing your species mix a little bit, um, you know, changing your recreation focus from, from uh, overnight to day use, for example. So there's many examples of small tweaks. And then we do often get groups that think of something new and different and completely outside of the box or completely outside of the norm uh, in order to better respond to climate challenges. So it's a little combination of all of these things, but we want to reiterate that your adaptation doesn't necessarily have to look new and completely different and, um, and you know, like something that you've never done before. Many of your actions might actually be adaptation actions. And this process is just a way of clarifying that and reiterating that. Okay, are there any questions before I turn it over to Leslie? I, I have a question. This might not be the right time to ask it. <laughs> um, but I'm thinking like our project actually is going to be a, a trail system through a region that has no alternative for car traffic. So we're thinking our project actually might be an adaptation for other, right? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like we're actually creating something that could help reduce car traffic. So is there a way to capture that in our project or where would we capture that kind of thought of us helping other adaptation? Yes. And I hold that thought and we'll get to that <laughs> in the, like 
like three slides. <laughs> so great question. So I'll I'll talk a little bit more about what you'll be doing in step four and where that kind of co-benefits thing fits in, because that is something that we're talking about. So in step four, what we will be doing is first we will be selecting adaptation approaches and tactics for implementation. So the approaches are the things you're going to select from the menu. And what you want to do is select approaches that are going to help address the biggest challenges that you identified in step three and capitalize on those opportunities you identified and help reduce the vulnerabilities that you identified in step two and still meet your goals. So think about everything came, that came before and which approaches are really going to address those big picture ideas that you identify. And then what you'll be doing next is select, de developing a tactic that describes a specific action that you're going to take in your place. And that's something you're going to be writing yourself. And there should be details in there about what you're gonna do, where you're gonna do it, and how you're going to implement it. You'll also be asked to identify a time frame. So specify when you're going to implement the tactic. So it could be a season, could be a year, it could be after a certain thing happens, or if, if something happens, then you're going to do this or um, within three years of some event happening. So however you wanna identify a time frame that works for you is totally fine. And here's where the benefits come in. So if you have an adaptation action that has other benefits, you can list them under this benefits um, category. So this is where we're going to describe why this tactic is good. So something that might have a lot of benefits is something that addresses either the biggest challenges you identified or multiple challenges you identified. Um, maybe it's really cheap and easy to implement. Maybe it has co-benefits. So it helps other people achieve their goals or it helps people adapt to other conditions in other ways or helps address other challenges that you're not concerned about, but you know are a bigger challenge in the surrounding area. And, and if it has a high likelihood of success, for example, if somebody nearby already tried this tactic and it worked really well, or there's good literature out there that supports implementing this thing, then those sorts of things would be really helpful to list in, under benefits. Then we also want to think about drawbacks and barriers to implementing your tactic. So are there some negative side effects? If you're going to be moving species around, for example, there might be some risks with whether they're going to adapt to the new environment or not. Or perhaps um, you're closing a recreation site, um, but it's really culturally important to the community. And so even though it's the best choice to do from a safety standpoint, it could lead to lost revenue, um, political implications, all sorts of things. So um, listing those sorts of things would be helpful in this step. Also think about the cost and effort required to implement it. Are there additional um, policies that might hinder your ability to implement this tactic? Would you need to raise a lot of money? Um, would you have to convince the surrounding community that this is a good idea? Those are the sorts of things we're looking for in the drawbacks and barriers category. And then we want you to weigh those benefits with the drawbacks. And what we're asking you to do, this is similar to the feasibility thing for step three. We want you to think about the practicability of your tactic. Whether it is both effective, is it going to meet your desired intent and feasible, so capable of being implemented. 
So if it has high practicability, that means usually your benefits outweigh your drawbacks and that you think that this thing is both effective and feasible. If it has low practicability, that means that the drawbacks and barriers are too high and the benefits are too small. We know that it's not the perfect word, but add it to your vocabulary and just start practicing it. You can make it the secret word of the day. <laughs> and then we'll ask you whether to recommend a tactic or not. So given all of this, is this tactic likely to be helpful? So consider all of those trade-offs of benefits and drawbacks and barriers and how important it is to implement that now and its likelihood of success. So if you think you're going to recommend it, you just um, select yes. And that doesn't mean necessarily you're gonna do it. It just means you're pushing it forward for further consideration. Or if you evaluate all the pluses and minuses and you decide not to recommend, you select no, and that's fine too. That just means that it's just not something you're going to pursue at this time. So I'm gonna walk through an example. This is a recent project that we worked on with the Mark Twain National Forest. This is not up on our website yet, so you're getting a sneak preview here. Uh, this is uh, the Red Bluff Recreation Area, which is on uh, the Potosi Ranger District in, on the Mark Twain National Forest in Missouri. And this site has um, a number of management goals. First, they have been experiencing a lot of flooding um, and damage in the last um, several decades. It's in a 100-year floodplain, and so their goal was to decommission facilities in the 100-year floodplain and convert the, those facilities to day-use areas. Um, and the goal there was to provide safe access to the river um, there and safely locate day-use infrastructure in the floodplain so that it can be used during um, times when it is not flooded. They also have some goals around stream restoration. So they wanted to restore their floodplain to a functioning state, stabilize your, their bank erosion, reduce sedimentation, um, and then remove and replace stream crossings. Some of the climate change impacts they were considering were warmer temperatures and warmer stream temperatures. It's um, getting wetter in this area and the main concern here is more heavy rain events and that the 100 year floods um, might come more frequently than every once once every 100 years and actually have been occurring more frequently than that and that when they do occur they become even more severe and um, alter the landscape considerably. There's also a potential for periods of drought and low stream flows. And this is a concern because this is a recreation site that um, is used for float trips or where people canoe down the creek. Um, so there might be times where it's so shallow that people are not able to get through. Uh, there's also concerns about tree mortality, both from flooding, but also from invasive insects like emerald ash borer, as well as um, the number of other um, local forest health issues. And then a concern for visitors is um, both more ticks and poison ivy. So actually poison ivy was one of the big um, hazards um, when they were doing clean up along these sites after floods several years ago. So some of the challenges were um, this changing flood frequency um, that could affect the facilities under consideration. So they wanted to provide a restroom facility for the day use areas, but pretty much everywhere close to these day use areas and near the creek was in the 100 year floodplain. Um, we already talked about 
the low flows and changing stream morphology as being a challenge for tubing and canoeing. And then hot days might limit the use of some exposed day use facilities. So they don't currently have a lot of shade down by the river um, because of all the tree mortality. Um, and so as things become hotter, there's a concern that nobody's gonna wanna sit down there. And then um, low, during low flows, uh, you might have hot, warmer temperatures because your, your streams are shallower, plus those are the periods that are hottest. And so that could really affect aquatic species habitat. They also identified some opportunities. So um, there were, in, oops, increasing opportunities um, and a longer season for alternative recreation. So more folks might be visiting in the spring and fall. And with these warmer temperatures, there might be more interest in visiting a stream to cool off um, and soak in the water during the summer. So um, that could bring in more interest to the site. So they um, evaluated a number of different approaches and tactics, and I'm just going to highlight a few of those. The first um, is approach 5.2, which is to recondition recreation-related infrastructure located in vulnerable areas. So they were converting their campsites that were located in a floodplain to day use areas that are close to the river. And then they actually, as another part of their project, moved um, the campsites up to a higher elevation site. They also wanted to alter the restroom facilities to withstand flooding. So they were exploring a couple of different ideas of maybe creating an elevated pit toilet or some sort of movable rest restroom facility. They wanted to um, relocate existing infrastructure and opportunities to areas with less risk. So that's where they move those campsites away from the water and up the hill and they moved the generators that they were using for power out of the floodplain. Then um, thinking about parking, they wanted to harden the upper parking lot in their floodplain area with pavement. And this was an area that had withstood previous flooding and the pavement seemed to be really resilient to that flooding. But then an area in the lower area, they were thinking about um, using gravel, um, which is an area that was more um, subject to severe washouts. For monitoring, uh, they were interested in monitoring visitation. So how are the number of visitors changing over time and visitor satisfaction? So both of these could be monitored using the national visitor use monitoring program that the Forest Service has to get at um, the effects of flooding. They were going to look at infrastructure damage and reduce days of access due to flooding. To reduce risk to people, they were looking at an early warning system where they could um, get people to evacuate prior to flash floods. And so, did they provide that enhanced communication and warning and was that effective? And then finally, they were looking at some indicators of stream bank stability and some other um, aquatic um, ecosystem indicators and monitoring that as well. So now it's your turn to try and implement an adaptation tactic. So what we want you to do is review all the menus of adaptation strategies and approaches. You'll probably want to start with the recreation menu since this is a recreation oriented course. But if you are working in an area where you're really focused on watershed management or you're working in an urban area, you might want to check out some of these other menus look through them, read through the example tactics that are listed to get a better sense of what those might look like. And you can choose any menu when selecting strategies and approaches. You're not 
stuck with one menu once you get started. You can mix and match to your heart's desire. It's sort of like being at, I don't know, a food court or something where you get, you know, your egg rolls from one place and some pizza from another. Um, anyway, you want to mix it up. And Danielle is just like, Leslie, what are you doing? <laughs> um, and then the main thing is to associate um, your tactics to relevant objectives. So thinking about which objectives you're trying to achieve with this tactic um, and determine if you want to re recommend that or not based on evaluating those benefits and drawbacks. And if you're not sure how to do any of this, um, you can use our adaptation workbook cookbook tutorial um, PDF or watch any of the recorded videos. And so once you get into your workbook, you'll find the links to all of those menus across the top there and you can click on those and that will send you to the longer version um, description of those menus. So that's just kind of background information for you. But then the main thing that you'll be doing is clicking on that add a tactic bu button there. And then you will get a um, pop-up that looks like this. And you will select your sector like urban, um, agriculture, recreation, um, then your strategy. Um, and then your approach, and then pick your tactical details. So describe your tactic, what you're going to do, those benefits and drawbacks, and then your time frame, and then pick on, pick your practicability, whether you have high or low or moderate practicability. You can also add more than one strategy or approach to that particular tactic by just clicking on that add strategy slash approach button. And so if you think that maybe you're going to implement an early warning system and it addresses both a communication strategy and it helps reduce risks to some infrastructure or something, you can have more than one approach under that tactic. Then you will go through and click on those recommended, not recommended buttons based on what you described in your benefits and drawbacks. So overall, just a few things to think about when you're going into the workbook. You can watch the video and that will show you how to add these tactics and strategies and approaches if you're ever stuck. You can also you know, get out of that if you need to by just clicking on that arrow button on the bottom. Then for next time, what you'll be doing is completing step three as needed, watching the required video on adaptation concepts, and that's about a half hour video. And that's really important for understanding these resistance and resilience and transition concepts. And then you will be completing step four on identifying adaptation actions and then your homework section after step four. You can also spend your time reviewing other menus of adaptation strategies and approaches. And there are often published papers associated with these different menus. And those provide even more detail that supports what that the intent of that approach and strategy is and often provides an extensive list of tactics. And we'll be going through that more in depth on Wednesday. And so I'd highly recommend if you want to dig deeper on these menus to join in our session on Wednesday. And that will be me and Kristen that hosts that. 
and we'll be focusing on the adaptation menu for recreation, but we'll talk about all the other menus as well. And you have two weeks to complete this step. This is often the biggest step other than step two. And so we're giving you extra time to complete it. So no lecture next Monday, May 3rd, get a week off. No discussion next week either. You get that time to just work on your adaptation strategies and approaches and check in with your instructors. So again, this Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, you should have all received a calendar invitation will be that optional presentation on the recreation menu. And then our next lecture will be in two weeks, Monday, May 10th, and that will be introducing step five on monitoring and evaluating effectiveness. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, um, or we can go back and review anything if we went through that too quickly. Everyone's so quiet. Anyone else want to share what animal they would be? <laughs> they could be any animal. Polar bear. All right. Love it. My daughter is doing an animal research project for her third grade class and she picked the raccoon. And they are pretty cool, I think. I really like this question, it's true. <laughs> Courtney, did you pick one yet? I did, I picked gray whales, mostly because I'm watching the Disney Plus uh, Secret of Whales and it's, so that's in my head. <laughs> Nice. Ooh, honeybee, I love it. Hedgehog or bobcat. Those are two very different animals. Last night we were playing with the kids like 20 questions, like guess, guessing an animal. I got them stumped with naked mole rat. <laughs> They're like, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> All right, well, thanks everyone. Um, does anyone else have questions? I'm just kind of killing some time so that people can ruminate a little bit, but um, feel free to drop off if you need to, or um, if you have any questions, we we'll, can stick around. I do have one question. Yeah. Um, you mentioned there was a, a monitoring component, I think, for like monitoring your tactics after you've implemented them is that mm -hmm. right? yes um one of our objectives you know we're not sure that we need to react to it right away um and i know we, we haven't kind of got to this step yet but one of um our thoughts was that the action may be to to monitor what changes happen mm -hmm. um, but would that be wrong to have kind of monitoring and then monitor your monitoring, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I, I do see what you mean. Um, and that has come up in the past. Um, I don't know if anybody else has a great solution to this question. Kristen? Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to say the same thing as you, Leslie. It, it comes up a lot. Um, and a, a good source of information for you might be your main project contact because having more context about your project they might be able to tell you like oh yeah this is something you can definitely save for step five and really focus on it there um i think the the this might be too detailed of a response but the trouble for me in putting it in the objectives comes in where you start thinking about like how is climate change going to affect that objective it's hard sometimes to 
you kind of end up going in circles when you start thinking about like, how is climate change going to challenge my ability to monitor this thing? And so since we have a dedicated spot for it in step five, I usually try to encourage people to, to move it to that section. But, um, but that said, depending on your project, sometimes it is appropriate to call out right away as a goal. So, so I think your, your project contact, um, whoever's been communicating with you on that might be able to give you a little more insight. Yeah, and sometimes like if there is an action that you're waiting to take based on monitoring information, it's possible that the action is described in step four and then under time frame, you could write like, you know, when monitoring indicates this action is needed or something. And then under your step five, you would detail the monitoring plan that's going to um, be the trigger for implementing the action. Does that make sense? That does. That makes great sense. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I, I had a similar scenario because some of my objectives were to inventory things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, the, yeah, I was doing homework last week. It's like, well, how is climate change going to impact my inventory? Which it could. I mean, because it could change more quickly or something. But I had the same issue. That I wasn't sure if it'd be inventorying wasn't the right objectives or something. Yeah, so maybe the act of, of implementing your inventory, like if you're doing physical field work um, to do it, um, then that might be what you describe in your challenges and um, your adaptation strategy might have something to do with in, you know, how you implement your inventory um, and not so much about um, what, you know, what questions you're asking or, how, you know, how many things you're monitoring, but rather the actual implementation of that program. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, that's helpful. Just to add to that, Leslie, I'd say, you know, one, one thing that might help too is just to, um, to ask the question, like, why are you inventorying? What's the intent behind your inventory? And that sometimes can lead you to another objective. So are you, um, you know, monitoring the diversity of plant species? Because what you really want to do is provide a diversity of plants on the ground, or you want to, you know, um, understand like when recreation infrastructure is no longer safe. Like I think sometimes um, our objectives get framed as inventorying, but the 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 actual objective has to do with you know creating that safe infrastructure or creating that diverse ecosystem. So there might just be a way to tweak it or or rephrase it along those lines that can help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, sometimes. I mean, you don't, you're not going to do an inventory for no reason, right? Um, there's got to be some underlying reason why you're doing it. Any other questions?